Let's wait a couple of more seconds and then we are ready to start. People are, are still joining. I'll try to be very generous German and I wait until 10.31, which is now 10.31. There we go. <laughs> right. Yes, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon uh, to our colleagues in Berlin and in Europe. Thank you all for joining us and a very uh, warm thank you also to Matthias Kramer and the Transatlantic Business Initiative, the TBI, for co-sponsoring today's discussion. I'm Christoph Schimjonik. I'm the head of the representative of German industry and trade here in Washington, D.C. We're here for more than 30 years and um, for more than 30 years, RDIT has served as the joint representation of the Federation of German Industries, the BDI, and the Association of German Chambers of Commerce and Industry, the DIHK, here in the United States. And uh, here are a few quick numbers for context on German business in the United States. We have over 5,600 German companies operating in the U US and uh, these companies, they employ more than 900,000 uh, workers. And uh, about 40% of those jobs are in the manufacturing sector. And uh, we are very proud and, uh, that uh, the latest data from the Department of Commerce, they show that Germany passed Canada last year to become the second highest provider of foreign direct investment in the United States with over 636 billion US dollars invested. Just a few quick housekeeping items before, uh, before we get started. Today's discussion is being recorded and we will make the recording available on our website. There will be an opportunity for audience Q&A at the end. And for this, please use the Q&A feature uh, to submit your questions, which our moderator will review and ask to the panel. And um, as always, please keep your mic and camera muted for now. And uh, now to today's topic. Economic issues are top of mind for many Americans as they prepare to cast their ballots. Employment, inflation, wages, and, and investment aren't just numbers. They are facts that impact people's li daily lives. The United States and the European Union share the largest trading relationship in the world, exchanging over $1 trillion in goods and services last year. In such an intertwined relationship, policy decisions on one side of the Atlantic affect business and consumers on the other. Many in Europe are closely following to see what decisions American voters will make this fall. And luckily, I'm very happy that we have assembled an expert panel today with plenty of policy knowledge and direct experience with economic policy making in Washington, D.C. Let me introduce our panel uh, panelists uh, briefly, um, starting with uh, Cleet Williams. Cleet is partner at the Aiken, Gump, Strauss, and Hauer and Feld. Cleet previously served in the White House as Deputy Assistant to the President for International Economics and Deputy National Economic Council Director. He also served eight years at USDR and worked as legislative director for former representative Paul Ryan. And we have uh, Stacy Ettinger, Stacy's partner at KNL Gates, and she was formerly chief counsel for Senator Chuck Schumer. She also served 15 years with the Department of Commerce as trade negotiator, legal and policy advisor, and litigator. And we have Peter Rushish, senior fellow and director at the Geoeconomics Program at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Peter has over 25 years of experience in transatlantic economic relations, including serving as Vice President for Europe and Eurasia at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and as Senior Advisor for Europe at McLarty Associates. Last and certainly not least, we are honored to have former Congressman Tom Graves here serving as our moderator for today. Congressman Graves served 10 years in the U.S. House of Representatives in addition to four terms as a Georgia State Representative. He was a senior member on the House Appropriations Committee and vice chair of the Special Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Thank you all for joining today, for taking the time, and I'm looking forward very much to our discussion today. And with this, I would like to pass over to um, Matthias. Well, thank you, Christoph. Thank you so much. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to all of you this morning, this afternoon, and look forward to an exciting discussion today. And I'm very proud that the TBI, our Transatlantic Business Initiative, is one of today's hosts. The TBI was founded last year by four big German uh, business associations, and 
our goal was and is to strengthen transatlantic transatlantic relations and to contribute the perspective of German companies on various transatlantic topics. And frankly spoken, the midterm elections and their impact on trade policy are not necessarily the focus of interest here in Germany. And to us, to me, that is this is really surprising because the importance of political developments in the US for transatlantic relations cannot be overstated. So with today's discussion, we also want to raise awareness in Germany a little bit. And uh, so I would like to thank all those involved for their commitment today. And to make it very briefly, I would then hand over now to you, Tom. Tom Graves, thank you very much uh, that you are the moderator of our session today. And I think now it's your turn. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, well welcome, everyone. Thank you, Matthias and Christoph. And uh, look, on behalf of uh, Republicans and Democrats, and uh, whether it's House, Senate, or the administration, let me just thank you and, and uh, all those uh, from Germany who invest in, in the U.S. who who uh, assist us here and and, um, and and find value in what what we do here and our partnership is um, uh, is remarkable and we really really are grateful for that. Well, I'm excited about this panel. Um, you know, I've had a chance to uh, I think probably uh, you know inter interface some way or another with most uh, whether it's through the think tank or through the administration or through. Uh, the Republican side when uh, Paul Ryan was in in the House. So when I'm when I'm looking ahead here, y'all probably want to so U.S. for 50 days or so away from an election. How does trade policy uh, interact into uh, this election, or is it at all? Is it even on the list? And so uh, we'll, we'll we'll start it off today with a little discussion about that. Get get a perspective, maybe Stacy from you first. How do you see uh, economic or trade policy in particular? Um, uh, you know being intertwined into our election process doesn't have an impact and then you know cleat uh, from you next and then uh, and then get the uh, the overall uh, perspective from peter on on the reality of the think tank side and is it important or not so uh, stacy starting off with you economic policy and midterm election great uh thanks so much um so you know, again, I think uh, where I think the DEM policy positions are, I don't think that there's necessarily a lot of daylight in terms of, you know, the overarching policies, maybe it's how they're implemented. Um, you know, basically we're looking at um, issues surrounding jobs, um, uh, concerns about outsourcing and, and, you know, the converse as we'd like to, to onshore, expanding economic uh, opportunities, supporting innovation. So I think going into the, Midterms, the Dems, um, with some bipartisan support, um, have a lot to talk about. Um, we'll talk about whether people are listening, but the three pieces of, you know, major pieces of legislation, the infrastructure bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, which focuses on the clean energy economy, and then the CHIPS Act, which talks about and supports innovation, entrepreneurship, and onshoring in the sem semiconductor sector. So I think all of those give, um, you know, uh, Dems that are uh, in, you know, that are up for re-election, uh, lots to talk about, right? You could localize things in the infrastructure bill related to, um, you know, roads, highways, bridges, high-speed internet is a big issue. Um, and then, you know, we're just now, um, you know, the, the last two pieces of legislation are so new that they're still in the sort of rollout phase. But, you know, there's definitely lots to talk about uh, in those, with respect to those issues as well. Yeah, Cleet, your thoughts? Sure. First, I would say as, as an overall matter, I don't see trade as a focal point for this election in the same way as you might see other issues. Inflation, I think, is, is, is um, you know, issue number one. You know, the, 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 the economic, the state of the economy overall, um, those issues are key. I think to the extent that trade does come into it, it's probably questions of supply chain and if I go to the store can I can I get this the stuff that I'm used to seeing on the shelves how long am I waiting how much does it cost but you know trade in and of itself I think is a little less of a, a focal point and, and part of the reason for that is you do see a more of a convergence I think between the parties on this issue than, than we've had in recent history and you see on the Republican side um, in, in, in the wake of the Trump administration, there's a little bit more populism. There's a little bit more acceptance of using tariffs and tools like that, which has historically been associated with the Democrat Party. And then on the Democrat side, 
you see somewhat of a frustration that a belief that the Trump actions weren't well targeted and they implicated allies and implicated relationships with key allies. And so you see sort of a more of a pro-trade bent, especially when it comes to, to working with our allies, which is traditionally more of a Republican position. So you see a little bit of a convergence here. And so I think it's less of a wedge issue than it's been in, in the past. And, and then when it comes to China, which I think is the way that it resonates most clearly for, for you know, average voters, um, the parties are pretty much aligned. And it's really a question of which party is going to be tougher on China and, and how did they prove that? Um, so I don't see trade as a determinative factor in this election as much as some of these other issues. I do, to Stacey's point, um, I do think Biden and the Democrats will get at least a little bit of a benefit from some of the legislation that they passed around chips and science and things like that. But I think it's going to be minor. And at the end of the day, I think uh, issues like inflation, I think social issues will be will be uh, play a larger role. One issue I hope we can get into later in this discussion is going to be if the House and or the Senate flip to Republican control, how will that affect trade policy? And, and I actually do think notwithstanding Republicans becoming slightly less open to trade, that the, the committees of jurisdiction, ways and means and finance are still very pro-trade on the Republican side. And so you will see a more tr pro-trade posture um, in, in GOP hands, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> oh, thank you. And Peter, just sort of reshaping the question a little bit, picking up on some things they said there. Cleet and, and Stacey both indicate there is sort of like some common areas here when it comes to Republicans and Democrats. Now, the current policies that have passed are unique for those that are participating here in the House and the Senate have voted not the same here. Uh, um, what the infrastructure bill was more bipartisan coming out of the Senate and more partisan in the House. The uh, uh, I guess chips was bipartisan in the Senate and less partisan when it got to the House. And then the uh, inf uh, I guess the Inflation Reduction Act was partisan all the way, it seemed like, through the process. When you look at where there is agreement and looking ahead in the studies you've done, where are areas that Republicans and Democrats can work on looking ahead into the next Congress? Do you see any areas where it gets less partisan and, and more pro-economic policy and pro-trade? Well, first, I would say that um, this year we don't ha we have neither uh, negotiations on, on a free trade agreement going on, and we don't really have, as we did a few years ago, any major trade conflicts going on. So I think that sort of those two things take trade out of the equation when you look at the midterms. And I also reinforcing um, uh, something I think both of the other speakers said, um, you know, China is a unifying factor. Um, and I think, yes, there is some competition, as Clint said, I think to sort of say who's got the best approach to China. But I think there's a lot of bipartisanship when it comes to the fact that we need to direct both our trade policies and some of our domestic policies towards the competition that China provides. So I think a lot of factors that are that are sort of um, um, shaping the the midterms in a way where 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 trade is not that prominent. Um, and I would also say, I guess one other thing where I would say um, there's at least tacit bipartisanship, I think, is in probably we'll get into this later is the role of the newish US EU Trade and Technology Council, where I don't see so far that becoming a source of friction between the two parties. Hmm. Yeah, good points. Um, picking up on a, a new a new trend that's occurred here, it, it seems like over the last two administrations, beginning of probably with the Trump administration, Cleet, you were and, and Stacey were probably heavily involved in the TPP. You know, do you do you remember that? I mean, that's going way back, TPA and then TPP. Uh, and and as the presidential election was was moving through in 2016, it became less acceptable to have trade agreements, so to speak. It became that populism. You're talking about populism. W looking at USMCA has since occurred, and that was, I guess, that, that was the last major trade policy. It seems like trade policy in the U.S. has gone more to small little packages, little, you know, bits and pieces here and there, generally from the administration. How does Congress get engaged again, and or does it? Or are we on a new path when it comes to trade policy? 
I don't know who is that for for me or for Stacy sure. Congress, but I'm excited to answer if you want if I can go first. Otherwise, but I defer to Stacy. Ladies first, if you'd like. Okay, <laughs> I'll I'll jump in. Look, um, so <laughs> Congress and the administration need to figure this out. Um, historically, we have had a robust consultation process. The Congress has passed trade promotion authority and it really dictated the terms on which the administration negotiated trade agreements. Um, we saw a pretty clear deviation away from that in the Trump administration with you know, the China phase one deal, a deal we did with Japan. Um, and, and, and I think now in the Biden administration, you see IPEF, you see the US-Taiwan uh, uh, partnership for trade for the 21st century, and there's no congressional oversight and Congress is mad. <laughs> and I actually expect you're gonna hear a lot of this Today, um, there's a hearing in Ways and Means on Taiwan. I think one of the things they're going to be talking about is the need to get um, more oversight over the process. So I think we are we are heading for a reckoning where there is frustration from um, Congress about the lack of oversight that they have over these agreements, and they're going to try to reassert that control. Um, one more point I do want to make is on, on TPP. Uh, and um, I will readily admit that when the president asked me what I thought he should do with TPP, I did I, I discouraged withdrawal, um, and I said, "Look, um, what you should do is renegotiate it." And, and I think the playbook for NAFTA is the exact same playbook we should ran, run on TPP. Let's look back a couple of years ago, 2016. NAFTA was an unpopular agreement in the United States. And you know what happened? We renegotiated it. We made it more consistent with our current policy priorities, and it got one of the biggest bipartisan uh, votes in support of USMCA that we've seen in years. That's the playbook, and and I just can't wrap my head around why we're not running that playbook on TPP. Um, and um, you know, I am working to encourage folks to think about TPP in the same light because I think at the end of the day, IPEF is not going to achieve our goals. If you go back to the first question, and wh why do people actually care about trade in the US right now? It's because they care about supply chain policy and they care about China and they wanna reduce reliance on China by moving supply chains to other countries. You cannot do it without market access, without tariff cuts. And so again, I've, I've put my cards on the table. <laughs> um, and I do feel strongly about this. I think what we need to do is figure out how do we renegotiate TPP so we can re-enter um, and then at the end of the day, I would like to see what we could do with Europe as well. But I'll, let's but let's put that in the, the the next level of ambition after after this project. Well, Stacy, just picking up on that, um, the administration has its challenges. There is a divided government, even currently, even though the Democrats control, in essence, all three of the major bodies there. Um, but it's still divided uh, politically in a lot of different ways. It, I mean, what is the administration's? What are their options moving forward with trade policy? Is it frameworks and small packages, or is there the opportunity? Do you see the openness or the appetite for larger negotiations? Well, I, you know, I think it's unfortunate that that you know we withdrew from TPP, and and what we've seen in the time since then is that China has solidified its footprint, you know, in the Indo-Pacific region. It's, there's a couple agreements that. Um, that China is a party to that we are not. And, you know, so I think the IPEF is, is the administration sort of baby steps toward trying to reestablish an, uh, a US presence in the region. I mean, look, in the long run, it could turn into something else. It could turn into a formal free trade agreement. But I think that, you know, it's possible that, you know, in the coming after the election, depending on, well, regardless of the makeup of Congress, um, there will be discussions. I mean, I think there's a desire to have discussions about, um, reauthorizing TPA. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at the staffing of USTR and the, the folks that were put in place, it's very heavily weighted towards people with, that came from Congress, you know, staff that came from Congress. And I think that potentially allows for productive negotiations um, on that issue. Um, I do want to talk about, um, you know, some of the, some of the trade issues. I mean, I agree with, we all agree that, you know, China's a big focal point. I think there's some interesting issues that are percolating that are somewhat discreet and, and in many ways more localized, but have bipartisan support. I mean, one of the interesting issues I think is um, there is a Senate proposal and House proposal related to uh, 
uh, prohibiting uh, sort of Chinese entities or other sort of foreign actors we don't like from purchasing agricultural land, right? And I think that that is kind of a, a bit of a sleeper issue. California just passed a law that sets that up, but there is also a proposal on the Senate side and then uh, House of Probes passed at the end of June, uh, the committee advanced language about this issue as well. Um, I agree with uh, Cleet that, you know, the Taiwan sort of policy related issues and legislation will have bipartisan support and, you know, could move as well. Um, but, you know, in that, in the somewhat vacuum where we don't have TPA, right, um, it's a chicken and egg thing. It's hard to move forward on formal negotiations without TPA. But in that vacuum, um, I think that President Biden will, will take executive action on a bunch of issues, um, which aren't necessary, which, which theoretically should have bipartisan support, but we'll see. I mean, anything from um, export controls related to chips and chip making equipment, um, but also implementation of the CHIPS Act and sort of the guardrails in the CHIPS Act related to um, sort of uh, recipients of federal incentives uh, engaging in significant activity and transactions in China. So, I, you know, I think there is potentially some common ground. It really, you know, hopefully politics won't get in the way. Well, if I could just um, follow back up with you, Stacey, on something. You've you've referenced TPA, Trade Promotion Authority, so is CLE. You referenced it's, uh, it needs to be reauthorized. Maybe explain what all that means to those that are listening. Uh, that's Washington speak, right? How do we how do we explain some of this Washington speak and what's the impact if it's not reauthorized and such and what happens, you know, forward? Sure. So Trade Promotion Authority is... Boy, y'all should know that. that I was I actually voted for that. That was a tough vote in the House of Representatives back in the day. And I was one of the Republicans that uh, that went with Paul Ryan in support of that. So that's why I want to hear about it. We, we appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. um, look, it's it, it creates a structure for form negotiation of formal free trade agreements in that it sets up timelines. It requires consultations with Congress. There are certain milestones in terms of letting, you know, setting out. Well, the TPA itself, let's go back. The legislation um, creates, establishes negotiating objectives, right? So Congress is gonna sign off on a whole bunch of negotiating objectives on all of the issues that are gonna come up in formal negotiations. And then it also creates this sort of formal structure with, again, timelines, consultation requirements, uh, you know, certain requirements to provide uh, draft text to members of Congress. Um, and ultimately, you know, the end goal and the sort of, you know, the, the most, probably the most important thing in the end is that uh, an agreement that is signed, uh, a free trade agreement that is signed while TPA is in effect would then get this what's called fast track authority. So when it would, when the final implementing legislation, so the legislation needed to implement the signed agreement goes before Congress, basically it cannot be amended. So it's going to get an up or down vote. Um, and then it and then it moves forward on a on a faster schedule as well. So that in a nutshell is kind of what it does. And without that, um, you know, it, it's not that the U.S. can't negotiate uh, the parameters of something that might be a free trade agreement. It, basically, if in some cases we've seen administrations sort of follow the even though TPA has expired, follow the framework, checking all the boxes required by the framework and then wait till TPA is authorized to sort of sign the agreement under the auspices of TPA and then take advantage of the fast track authority. So if, if I could jump in, I, I actually do think this is an area where where there is a little bit of divergence between our parties and where you could see an impact um, on on the house flipping potentially. And in particular, you know, th right now, a lot of Democrats on the Hill are saying that they want the Congress to reauthorize something called trade adjustment assistance, which is essentially money that goes to workers um, who are affected by by trade writ large. That that program has expired right now in, in the United States. It's sort of like an extended unemployment benefit and different kinds of, of things like that. Um, re historically, Republicans have allowed TAA, so the, the assistance to go forward only when it's been coupled with this TPA, which is this negotiating authority. And they've sort of been seen as, well, if we're going to give assistance to our workers, we need to also be negotiating agreements. And right now, that that is the kind of dynamic that you have where Democrats have been pushing for the assistance and Republicans have been saying, well, what about the Trade Promotion Authority? 
And so I do think, you know, there is potential for a deal there. Um, it probably becomes more likely if you have a Republican controlled um, House, because, again, notwithstanding the strains of populism that are growing in, in the Republican Party, if you look at Ways and Means and you look at finance and you look at Mike Crapo and Kevin Brady and whoever succeeds him, they are generally more establishment pro-trade Republicans who want to see TPA. And, and so I think they are going to push the administration for that and they're going to push the administration for a more, more pro-trade agenda. In the short term, one option I want to throw out there that I think is interesting and is being discussed is typically TPA applies to any trade agreement you negotiate. There is at least some discussion right now about whether there are targeted countries for which we would give a limited grant of TPA because those trade agreements don't raise the same concerns as others. And the three that I've heard being discussed are number one, Taiwan, um, where there is sort of this geopolitical imperative at the moment, not to mention you know, how linking semiconductor supply chains. The UK, which doesn't have some of the same kind of labor issues um, that some of the other uh, FTAs that have been objectionable have had. And then the Kenya trade agreement, where I think from a, and Stacey can speak to this, I don't want to speak for the Democrats, but where there might be sort of um, more of a willingness to, to do a trade agreement with a more developing country, um, you know, because of sort of the interest in among many um, members of the Democratic Party of sort of building ties with Africa. And so I, I think Kenya is another one where you could see this limited authority um, as a potential uh, compromise moving forward. Great. Great. Well, I know we have another 10 or 15 minutes of this moderated discussion, and then maybe we'll get some questions from others. But Peter, going to the think tank per perspective, um, I think we can all agree that trade is good. Trade policy is good. It's good for the United States. It's good for our friends that we develop policy or, or agreements with. It's it's good for other, uh, other economies. It's good for um, wealth uh, growth in other, other areas of, of the world and such. How do we, or what are think tanks doing today to um, to educate newly elected members that are coming through this process and, and a populism movement in essence? How, what are, are think tanks doing anything to educate uh, uh, newly elected members on on the positives of trade and free trade or trade negotiations? Well, what I would say is I think that um, as far as I'm concerned, and others that I that I watch, uh, there's there's an effort to explain how the context for trade is changing. I would say I think that's really where a lot of effort goes into. And what I mean by that is that, you know, whether it's the fact that uh, the World Trade Organization's rules haven't been updated since it was founded, whether it's the rise of China and its state capitalist economy, new technologies. Um, uh, con increasing concern about climate change. I think there are a lot of, you could sort of say, external factors to the trade policy making process which are impacting what trade policy should be about. And I think that um, it's probably, I don't think these issues are going to go away. And so I think that means that trade policy is bumping in, is, you know, it has its main, its main goal is to increase prosperity. And, you know, that's, pro that's probably the biggest goal it should continue to have. But I think it's bumping into these other concerns about national security and values, and I don't think it can it could ignore those if it wants if we if if the United States wants to get a consensus about a trade policy that can still believes in opening markets. So I think that's where the the sort of center of gravity is right now. You know, Stacy, going to you and thinking about trade policy and in today's new new politics, what do you think are like the two or three? Um, bedrock things that Democrats should focus on when it comes to trade policy? Is it opening markets? Is it, uh, you know, is it climate policy? Is it, what What are those two or three things? And then Cleet from you as well, from Republicans, are there, do we align parties on the positives of trade policy? <laughs> Just two ways to answer that question, right? There's sort of the the wish list of what we should do versus the reality. So I'm going to focus on the reality of what I think Democrats should fo should focus on as opposed to the wish list. And I put sort of anyway. So the reality is, um, from a political perspective, I think the focus remains on um, the domestic economy. Right? It remains, you know, jobs are important, onshoring is important. We need manufacturing. We need to. 
uh, you know, work on our own supply chain resilience. And I think that that resonates with people um, for a variety of reasons. And we need to, as a, you know, from a, from a, you know, strategic perspective, we need to ensure that we have, and we are establishing domestically, um, a sufficient expertise and manufacturing in high tech areas um, and in the technology of today and tomorrow, right? And whatever years into the future. So I think as a practical matter, uh, a political matter that Democrats should be very much focused on that. And I think the new pieces of legislation, the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act with the, um, you know, the energy uh, infrastructure incentives are key and will be a very big focus. Um, uh, and that plays into some of the other uh, issues, including, you know, the client related, uh, climate related issues. But, um, you know, I mean, I think one of the interesting things in the Inflation Reduction Act, and again, in these um, new incentives for energy infrastructure is that there are provisions related to manufacturing capacity, but also the, the skill set for individuals to work in those sectors. And I think that that's critical. Um, and I think that that's where Democrats should focus. And opening markets, I don't, I mean, I don't disagree with that. And in the long run, we want to sort of, we Did we lose? That, that, that is always a focus and always important. Perfect. Cleve, what are your thoughts from the Republican side? Yeah. Do, do Republicans overlap anywhere there? A little bit. <laughs> And and I will say, I mean, I, I think what the principal focus for Republicans is going to be in the next Congress, I think it's going to be going to be two areas. I think that the first is really going to be um, promoting once again a, a market opening pro trade agenda to get back in the business of negotiating real trade agreements. I think that's what Republicans would like to see, um, especially again coming from the committees. And I, I will acknowledge um, there is a little bit of a distinction, I think, between the, some of the rank and file, some of the new members coming into the House and the, sort of the more establishment figures on the committees. And that's going to shake itself out over time. But I think in the short term, um, you're going to see a lot of pressure from the committees and the Republicans on the committees for a market opening agenda. And I think that's totally appropriate for a lot of the reasons we've already discussed. I think the second focus um, for Republicans where there, there clearly is overlap you know, is on sort of the US China competition related issues. And and this gets out of the area of sort of core trade agreements per se. Um, but but looking at, you know, things like investment screening, including outbound investment screening, looking at export control measures, um, looking at a whole range of tools that we can use in the trade and technology competition with China. And then ultimately, um, figuring out how to coordinate those actions with allies around the world. And this is where I do think, you know, countries like Germany really come into play here. Um, you know, how are we are we are we working together on these issues? Um, are we truly taking a, a constructive, coordinated approach to deal with some of these problems with China? Um, and, and, I, and I think that is what you know, will be a focal point. The other area, I mean, again, of course, is supply chains. We've already sort of touched on that. Um, I think supply chains is an area where um, Republicans will really want to operationalize this concept that the administration has talked about um, of, of friendshoring. And again, working with allies and partners on critical supply chains. So those are three areas where I think that 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 you will see a focus from Republicans. And I would say the last two, I do think there's definite overlap. I think on the first one, maybe there are targeted areas where we can work on, on market access together. One last thing I'll just put in the mix. I think it needs to be part of this longer term equation, although I'm not sure it'll be an immediate focus. It's sort of reforming the international system. Um, I think if anyone's being honest with themselves, the WTO is not getting the job done right now. Um, and notwithstanding some minor successes at the last ministerial, it is really just not fit for the current challenges. And we need to figure that out. Great, thank you. And it, you know, uh, for those listening in, I mean, you just heard 
some priorities, right? And 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 so as you're shaping and you're thinking about the next year or two, um, you just you just heard from two experts on what different parties will be looking for as you uh, shape your argument. So that's very very helpful. Thank you both, Stacy and Cleet. Um, all right, so you want to talk about next year? You want to talk about post midterms? There's a lot of projections. Um, um, it, no matter what happens, it will probably be divided one way or another. E even if one party controls everything, I think we all see that even that's that's a struggle. Uh, there's a lot of independent minds in both Republican and Democrat parties. There's a lot of uh, push and pull and a lot of tension when it comes to economic policy, uh, climate policy, spending policy, all the different policies, but in particular as it relates to economic policy. Um, Stacey, you just heard a little bit about what the priorities of the Republicans would be coming out. They come, come out of the gate strong with a couple of items as it relates to trade. Uh, how, how would the Biden administration respond to that? Would they embrace some of that? Are there areas in which they could work or is there just an automatic uh, uh, you, you put up some guards and some, you know, you, you protect yourself from it? How, how does that work? How does the administration respond? Uh, no, we we can um, walk and chew gum at the same time, I think. So uh, I'm pretty confident about that. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that would be welcomed by the administration. Um, we, we, you know, things have become more politicized than ever. We, you know, we've been saying this now for the past, say, six years. And it's unfortunate because there should be, there are a lot of areas of common ground. Um, and, um you know, again, I think that the administration is well positioned that if there is a desire and a push to sort of work on um, TPA and the certainly the you know potential you know focus for a limited number of negotiations that Cleet mentioned, you know, I agree with. I, I think the administration would welcome that. You know, we'll see whether or not there is enough um, uh, coordination and bipartisanship on that issue. Um, you know, again, I think the administration will be very focused on implementing. Uh, you know, infrastructure, the infrastructure legislation, the CHIPS Act, and um, the the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which has all the clean energy programming in it um, and incentives for building out our clean energy infrastructure. So that that's going to, you know, be a major focus. Um, and again, there are the executive actions, again, on some of the important issues that, I mean, Cleet has mentioned, could be done by executive action if there is if there is not a way to do it in legislation and you know um now some of those are not popular with the business community so for example an outbound investment review mechanism extremely unpopular with the business community um so we'll see what happens there it would be nice to have bipartisan support for that because it would present a united front and also allow sort of bipartisan work with the business community to try and alleviate concerns that they have for such a mechanism um you know, I, I think that's it. Again, there are some specific issues that I do think we'll make some progress on. I mean, there is discussion about the U.S. moving forward on its own carbon border adjustment measure. Um, you know, the EU is much further along in the process and seems to be moving to some sort of um, uh, phased in implementation starting in 2023. And the U.S. is just going to have to play catch up at this point unless it comes up with its own mechanism. So I think it's good that we have uh, a potential sort of bipartisan discussions on that. I'm not sure we'll ever get agreement. It's such a complicated issue. And we might just end up, um, you know, following what the EU does on that issue. But, you know, it's worth discussing. Right. Yeah. And uh, in no way was I trying to imply that the administration can't walk and chew gum. Uh, you know, but for those that aren't familiar with American politics, it, it, it goes like this. If somebody else is for it, then you're just against it. That just seems to be the way it is these days. And so hopefully we move past that because there are things that actually both parties do agree on and they agree on it privately, but publicly it's really hard because of just the political pressures to uh, show agreement with your adversary. Um, Peter, I'm gonna go with a question to you next, and then we'll do two two sort of final questions that are Germany related, if that's okay for uh, Stacy and, and Cleet. Uh, but Peter, just, just looking ahead into the next term, what from a think tank perspective, from the community of think tanks that work on trade and economic policy, is there just that, that that must do kind of thing that must happen or needs to happen in the next year or two? Um, that we've been missing. You know, there's a lot of big policy that's moved through Congress over the last couple of years, sweeping policy in a lot of cases. Is there any anything that needs any adjustments, any cleanup or any advances that Congress really just needs to focus on and look, looking ahead? I think that the last issue that 
um, Stacy mentioned, the interaction between trade and climate is something that's going to be tough to put off much longer. I, I can see that it's not an easy lift uh, on the Hill and, and maybe not an easy lift, uh, you know, for example, to agree on something like a carbon price uh, as part of a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, there probably are um, there are probably even some differences on what that would look like if the U.S. were to to follow in the EU's footsteps. But I think that the reason I say that it would be helpful if 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 in the Congress they there could be some um, move towards some real legislation where the U.S. decides how it's going to treat carbon intensive imports is that. Um, for two two reasons. One is that if we don't do that, there's a real risk of trade frictions with our most important trading partners and friends and allies, and number one, the European Union. Second of all, um, I think what this is longer term, so it's not not directly related to your question in terms of what needs to be done in the next year or two, but long, a little longer term seems to me there needs to be a reform of WTO, rule, WTO rules to allow countries to have more room to deal with the climate than they probably have now. If and, and, and it would be a shame if you were to test what countries are doing on climate through a WTO case that would just produce all sorts of new frictions. But in order to get WTO re rules reformed, I think you need to have the US and the EU and some other important like minded trading partners, Japan, others all lined up. And if the US and the EU are going to starting next year have a dispute on carbon border adjustment, it's going to make it really hard to have find the goodwill for them to work together to reform WTO rules. Mm. Yeah, great insight. That's that's very important for everybody to start thinking about because you're absolutely right. Um, so Stacy, going going to you earlier when we were just sort of in our, um, I guess, the green room aspect, you, you brought up something I thought was fascinating that I think would be great for you to highlight and, and touch on a little bit more. I'm mean, talking about the anti-China sentiment in the US that that movement both Republican and Democrat and such how does how, how do manufacturers or suppliers in Germany um, navigate that when they actually have part of their supplies coming out of China and you were, you were talking about that supply chain side can you build on that just a little bit because I think that that's an interesting challenge that a lot of our friends deal with well and there's certainly thanks for the question there certainly are you know plenty of US manufacturers in addition to, you know, that also face this sort of try to balance out. Um, the, the, the part of this is just rhetoric because that, you know, when you're talking about a populist issue, China's the boogeyman, you know, in the eighties, for those of you that remember, you know, Japan was the boogeyman, now we have China's the boogeyman. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, again, looking, circling back to some of the new programs that are in place here, um, you know, when you're talking about the CHIPS Act, for example, I mean, there is no corporate nationality test. So to the extent that there are German companies on the ground in the United States that are in playing in the semiconductor sector or want to play in the semiconductor sector, there's no barrier to that. Um, the same thing on energy infrastructure projects. I mean, obviously Germany is a, is a trusted ally. You, you know, the United States just takes the, the sort of China threat issue um, further, probably than most other countries. And so it is something that, um, you know, foreign companies, German companies need to be aware of. And it is, it is not directed at German companies, but there's definitely a concern. And we've, you know, we've even seen in prior like CFIUS processes where, um, again, a German investment in the United States would certainly not necessarily raise eyebrows, but if the German, the German company had a joint venture in China in that sector, that was a cause for concern under our sort of overarching concern about national security issues related to China. So, I mean, I, German companies, I think are quite well aware of where the United States stand on China issues. And like, like some other uh, strong allies, you know, Korea has to struggle with this, Japan has to struggle with this as well. Um, and, you know, even in, interestingly, like in the IPEF um, discussions, you know, the U.S. also is using that, aside from reestablishing itself in the in the Pacific region, is also using it as a way to um, pressure is too heavy a word. I was trying to think of something lighter, but pressure our allies to side with us, with the United States, with China on the other side of that equation. But it's difficult for countries in the region, um, and also for countries like Germany that have 
pretty strong ties to China. So they're kind of stuck in between. This is a very important market for us. We do a lot of business with China, but you know, the United States wants us to sort of side with them to try and sort of wall off China. And it is a balancing, a delicate balancing act. And I imagine some German companies specifically, but also sort of from a government perspective um, are also in that, how do we walk that line between not pissing off our, you know, a major market for us, a major partner on the one side and the United States, which also is a major market and partner on the other side. So that's a, that's a real uh, interesting issue and a tough issue. Right. I can see that issue, particularly as it relates to German auto manufacturers and electric vehicles and uh, the, the challenges that that they face after making significant investments in, in the United States. So my, I guess my last question, if uh, if we want to get ready for uh, any audience questions, um, would be looking ahead, um, so Cleet with you first and then and then Stacy. I mean, where are the where are the next best opportunities uh, for trade policy as it relates to us and, and our friend Germany? Um, Give us some good examples there of where um, some opportunities exist that maybe we just haven't seen and and we should be pursuing. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there are opportunities, and um, I was I was joking earlier about sort of you know the level of ambition it would take to get a U.S. EU you know free trade agreement. I mean, I, I don't think that's in the cards, but I do think working through the U.S. EU Trade and Technology Council and and jointly pressuring our governments now it's it's the commission of course in the eu um that, that that runs the show but they are listening carefully to the member states i think trying to turn that into something meaningful um and and, and not just the latest iteration of the us eu talk shop um is 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 going to be important but i do think it's a real opportunity because this administration to their credit has tried to resolve problems with the EU, with the eu and trying to cultivate the US EU relationship. So I think there's a real opportunity there. So far, I think that body has done pretty well with the Ukraine, um, you know, the Ukraine situation and coordination on sanctions and export controls and other things like that. Um, I personally would like to see it do a better job coordinating on China related issues. I think it can do a better job um, on sort of future technology standard setting. That's what it's it's supposed to do. So I think that, that that's an area where um, it could focus. Personally, I think it, we should make off limits current irritants. Um, you know, our, our administration has been nervous. I think the EU has been nervous about sort of putting in play longstanding irritants where they've gotten bogged down. But those are real irritants with real commercial implications, and I wouldn't be afraid to put them on the table. Um, and I think from an EU perspective, putting the U.S. Uh, electric vehicle tax credit on the table is probably the way to go. I think American companies would love to talk more about the EU's digital policy, you know, as just one example. But my, my point is, let's use that for uh, as, as a way to do it. I want to touch quickly on some, two other points that were, were made. Um, first, on, on carbon border adjustment, that's another thing where I think there's a, a real opportunity for coordination here. You know, Republicans in the U.S. are, are open to it. The problem we have is there's not much of a willingness, especially on the Republican side, but I think also on the Democrat side, to set a domestic carbon price. And without that, it makes it very difficult to figure out how this thing works. So uh, we may need your help and your creative thinking, but what I would not want to see is the US and EU do this in different ways and then end up in a trade war over it. So I think intensive uh, discussion on that in the short term is going to be important, notwithstanding some of the challenges we have here. And then I would just say on the China question more generally, you know, the perception in the U.S., and again, I'm just going to lay it out there. I, the, um, you know, the perception in the U.S. is that Germany has been a little bit of an obstacle to greater U.S.-EU coordination on China. Now, there's also a perception that that is starting to change and, and there was some reporting recently that Germany is considering things like an outbound investment screening uh, mechanism with respect to China and looking at, um, you know, what it can do on export controls and other areas. I think that would be a sort of a watershed moment in the relationship that really could move it in a positive direction. But I but I fully acknowledge that for some German companies who have reliance on the China market, it could be painful. Uh, and I'll just say, trust me, our companies are going through the same thing. But I think we all need to step back and say, OK, what is the long term trajectory of the business we're going to do in China? What does China actually want? I mean, does China actually want to remain reliant on our on our exporters? 
probably not over a longer period of time. And so I think we need to get ahead of that and think about how are we going to continue to engage in the market in certain areas, but where are other areas where we want to rethink some of our supply chain strategy? Mm, great. Stacey, any thoughts on opportunities with uh, the industry there in Germany? Sure. Um, you know, I agree with Cleet on the on on making use of the TTC construct. I think that there's a lot of opportunity there, um, and uh, I agree with those comments. And um, you know, one thing, and I want to this is something that Cleet had mentioned earlier on in this discussion about this French shoring issue. And I think that that's an important issue where you know if we're trying to say increase supply chain resiliency. In, in semiconductors, we don't have to have all the fabs in the United States, right? We can have fabs in uh, trusted allies in Europe, including in Germany or you know other European countries. But I think that that kind of trying to figure out how to make that work, how the United States coordinates with the EU, Germany, and other countries, with this idea that we're not stepping on each other's toes or competing for the same facilities or investment, you know, in building. You know, whatever, whether it's semiconductors or or automotive technology or other new technologies, right? Um, and I think that that's important. It's an interesting, you know, how we have to, to me is interesting and something to think about going forward. And I know the administration and, and and members of Congress are thinking about this issue as well. And what do we, how do we make that work? Like, what does that mean? Like down in the weeds, how do we do this sort of friend shoring concept? Um, and I think we need to continue exploring that issue. Great. Stacey and Cleet and Peter, thank you for your insightful, thoughtful comments here on the questions I had. Um, Matthias, uh, do I turn it back to you or Jay um, for any questions from the uh, the viewers there? Or um, you, you can give me direction or Christoph. Sure. Uh, Thank you. I'll, yeah. I'll just, Jay. Uh, Christoph, go ahead. Okay. No, I just want to say, oh, so yeah. audience is more than welcome to post their questions in the Q&A chat. So please uh, use the Q&A function in order to post any questions you might have. That's but, great. You may have to read those off uh, if you get them Christoph. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, actually, OK, I have them if you want me to work through that. I cannot see. Do you see anything or I do yet? have one from Matthias there. Look at this. He says the impact of the IRA on German business opportunities in the US in the area of e-mobility and climate protection technologies is likely to be enormous. Couldn't the, um, couldn't this also lead to German and European companies turning their attention to the Chinese market again? In other words, doesn't this run counter to the idea that China is a unifying factor? That Peter was talking about. So, uh, Stacey, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I understand the question, and I, I see what you're saying. I think, though, that in the long run, you know, projecting ahead, I think we end up kind of splitting the the world into two buckets on some of this technology, and I think that. German and European companies, I get it. Um, you know, there's there's money to be made now. Um, there's strong ties, but in the long run, we need to. I think, I think sort of Western democracies need to take a, a long term view, much like China takes a long term view. We need to think about where we are, not just now, not just in five years, but into the future. And so, it's it's a it's a it's a policy. It's a discussion that you know. Governments have to have, companies have to have, and they really need to take a long-term view because the short-term view is is brought us to where we are now, and it's um, not necessarily a positive place to be. So I can uh, I can speak uh, maybe e even more directly because uh, my party didn't vote for that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, let's just be honest. It was a poorly designed, uh, poorly designed tax credit, right? And you know, there's two components to it. One component, which, you know, requires, you know, final assembly in North America. I mean, it just just kind of unnecessary, in my opinion. And um, it, it was sort of a, 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 a an unforced error by the U.S. that I agree led to tension that didn't need to be there. Um, and, and so that's going to they're going to need to work that out. 
The second part of it is about sort of reducing reliance on China for some of the critical minerals that go into, um, you know, large capacity batteries. And, you know, I do think that's an area where trying to figure out how to phase that out of our supply chains or at least release reduce our reliance could be helpful over the long term to both of us. And so I would say, uh, you know, being charitable, there is an element here that 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 can contribute to that cooperation, but then being critical, there's an element that I think was just in poor drafting, shouldn't have been done, um, and has led to unnecessary tension. And I hope that over time we can figure out how to work through that. All right. Uh, let me see. We have one uh, one last one here. Let's see. Talking about French shoring and looking into the IRA with its focus on domestic growth, how much appetite? Is there ready for putting French shoring into practice? Uh, Cleet, you want to pick up on French? Yeah, shoring? sure. I mean, it, it, the term out there first, so we'll let you go. First. Well, look. Um, so I think if you look at the IRA, um, it, it, and I don't mean the IRA as a whole, but I'm sort of still thinking about this tax credit. So let me start with there with that issue. I mean, um, there was a component of French shoring there, right? It was about reducing reliance on China writ large. And, but then the French learning only identified two friends, you know, Canada and Mexico, and there should have been more. So, I mean, again, I think that concept got in there. It didn't get in there in the way that it should have, in my opinion. Now, more broadly speaking, the idea of French learning, I will say one of my critiques of the administration has been that they've talked a good game on this, but they haven't really created the right incentives to make it happen. And, and I would really like to, to see us with, as I've talked about earlier, a more proactive trade agenda that looks at operationalizing that. You can either do it through comprehensive agreements with our friends, or another way to do this is to create sectorals or maybe plural laterals through the WTO where members that meet a high standard and agree to certain rules can reduce tariffs, reduce regulatory burdens between them. Um, one area that I think we should be looking at is sort of the healthcare sector, and in particular, you know, how do we prepare for the next pandemic by not putting export restraints on each other and keeping tariffs low between the U.S. and Germany? So again, I think there are definitely there's definitely some appetite. I would say um, the Republicans who are coming in, who may come into power, I think will in, in the House and Senate will want to push that. Um, I, I think the administration has talked a really good game about it, and I, I'd like to see more from them in terms of actual practice. But Stacy can tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> I would never, I would never do that, Clee. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I will, like, my, I will make one little point about the IRA when you're talking about this assembly in North America. That component, that that particular provision you're talking about, and, and I agree with you, but that particular provision is in the context of electric vehicles, right? So the IRA is much larger. Um, all kinds of uh, tax credits and programming related to uh, the energy sector as well. So obviously electric vehicles is one important issue. And I agree that, you know, in the probably in the rush to get it done, the drafting is not a modicum of clarity and does cause problems. But I think that I think that Treasury has the flexibility to address that issue um, through guidance. And I am confident that they will do so. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that turns out. But um, you know, I agree though, back to this, we need some sort of construct and I like Cleet's ideas about how we might formalize a structure for, for addressing the concept of French story and how we can create those um, partnerships again so that we are working together, not stepping on each other's toes and creating um, uh, something that, that allows us to have uh, um, comfort about supply chain resiliency in in a larger group of like-minded countries. Could I just add that I I think we also need to define first what we mean when we say a friend. I, I think some people think a friend is means that you, if you're a democracy or if you're a friend, I think others say as long as you're not China and Russia, you're a friend. My own view is it's somewhere in between, but I think we need to have some kind of understandable um, metrics for what we mean when we say a friend. I agree 100%. Good points, good points. Well. Let me thank Stacy and Cleet and uh, Peter for your um, your insights today and, and your comments. Really thoughtful, and uh, you know, and Stacy and Cleet, I know you've put a lot of time and service in for for our government, different capacities. I'm grateful for that. I mean, it's it's clear that um, uh, y'all have been thought leaders and policy leaders for a long time. Peter, for your work at the think tank, it's uh, we couldn't do it without you. You know, guys like me who actually are, are casting the votes. Um, we have to get the ideas from somewhere, right? And it's either great staff 
or it's good think tanks. Uh, it's, it's generally not our own our own ideas. So we're grateful for the work you do there and for uh, you know the German industry and trade group for putting this on. I'm glad to be a part of it. Thanks for letting me moderate and for the sponsorship there of Transatlantic Business Initiative. Uh, but uh, Christopher, Christoph, turning it back to you. Thank you very much. I couldn't have prepared any better. Thank you, notes. Thank you, Tom, for moderating and uh, for thanking our panelists. It was a real pleasure listening to you, listening to your experience. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon again. And um, on the 28th of September, we have our Oktoberfest here, so I hope to see you all here. <laughs> great. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Have a great week. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you so much. Greetings from Berlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.